And in business, the COVID-19 pandemic is impacting emerging markets through an unprecedented combination of domestic and external shocks. Amongst the latter, the pandemic has led to a sharp increase in global rise aversion and an abrupt retrenchment in foreign capital flows. However, in Nigeria, organizations like the ANAP Foundation, Think Tank for COVID-19, seeks to help in the fight of the pandemic. I spoke with Atedo Peterside, Chairman, ANAP Foundation, Think Tank for COVID-19. Now, the ANAP Foundation Think Tank is at the forefront of preferring recommendations on how to fight COVID-19. As the chairman of the Think Tank, why take up this course? Okay, in fact, that's a very good question. I've been asked by many people that if you say you want to contribute to COVID-19 fight in Nigeria, which is a major battle of our lifetimes, why would you set up a Think Tank? There are two broad reasons. And first, let me make it very clear that if this was Germany or South Korea or Taiwan, I wouldn't think about setting up a think tank. The two broad reasons are as follows. Number one, the COVID-19 fight everywhere in the, in, in, the, in the world has three pillars. One is the medical pillar. The second is the governance pillar. And the third is about communications, communications pillar, because you have to communicate with the populace. Now, in Nigeria, we know we are weak medically, but that's, that, that was not the reason for the think tank. The main reason for the think tank was to help to address the governance weaknesses and the communication weaknesses that could, between them, eclipse the medical pillar. So that's the first you know, you know, reason. The second reason has to do with the federal government's response to COVID-19. And please, I'm not blaming anybody, but they set up a presidential task force Every single member of that presidential task force is from the government sector. And I believe there's an outside, one person is from outside, from WHO. So you don't have a single member of the private sector on the, on, on the presidential task force. Not that that by itself is a problem, but when you think that in terms of aggregate demand for, for goods and services, 91.5% of Nigeria's economy is private sector. And government sector is only 8.5%. I was worried that the, the, the reviews of the private sector, the priorities of the private sector might be missing in the presidential task force. Because one knew in advance that very soon choices will have to be made, including things like when do you allow what type of business to reopen and things like that. And I was not confident that a 100% government, government membership could address that effectively. For one, so in life sometimes it's about where the penny pinches. Everybody on that think tank is short of getting their salary in full at the end of every month. Of My think tank is concerned about those people whose businesses have been brought to zero, who have absolutely no income and are facing bankruptcy. That group of persons is not present on the presidential task force. So we're trying to represent all shades of opinion and fill the gaps that are missing in the presidential task force. So those are the two broad reasons. Talk a bit about the need for each state to devise its own solution to fighting the, the pandemic spread as against the one-size-fits-all approach. You see, the, the best example, or should I say the worst example that I can find of the danger of one-size-fits-all is when they announced the curfew for Lagos, for Ogun, for Abuja, Please, eh, a curfew that begins at 8 p.m. until 6 a.m. may not destroy commerce in Calabar or in, Medu or, or in Meduguri. It may not destroy commerce in Makodi, but in Lagos, it destroys commerce. Because Lagos is a big, congested city. In, the, in normal times, Lagos wakes up well before 5 a.m. Before you get to the market at 8 a.m. or 7 a.m., there has been a beehive of activities. There's been a supply chain activity. You've had, you've had all kinds of, of movements of fresh produce overnight so that they can arrive in, 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 in the market in the morning fresh. When you disrupt all those things, it, it, it's a big problem. I give an example of one company, a food company. They always run two eight-hour shifts, which meant that for the same amount of machinery, the first group of workers 
if, if they were 400 or 1,000. They worked for eight hours. And then they handed over to a second group of workers that worked for eight hours. When the government threw out a curfew, with the curfew, they can only operate a single shift. Because you cannot run two eight-hour shifts within this curfew where workers have to leave home after 6 a.m. and they must arrive home before 8 p.m. So I'm going to show you how a curfew has forced that company to reduce their maximum capacity from 100% to 50% because they are now operating on a single shift. So you jeopardize the jobs of half the workforce in that company because the company cannot run two shifts. So it is important that we quickly come back and, and change those types of rules that, as far as I'm concerned, have little or nothing to do with COVID-19. They are just errors of governance.